Chapter 9. Why are you lying? Anne-Marie went outside alone after supper. Through the open window, she could hear Mama and Ellen talking as they washed the dishes. Kirsty, she knew, was busy on the floor playing with the old dolls she had found upstairs. The dolls that had been Mama's once, long ago. The kitten had fled when she tried to dress it and disappeared. She wandered to the barn where Uncle Henrik was milking Blossom. He was kneeling on the straw-covered floor beside the cow, his shoulder pressed against her heavy side, his strong tanned hands rhythmically urging her milk into the spotless bucket. The god of thunder sat alertly poised nearby, watching. Blossom looked up at Anne-Marie with big brown eyes and moved her wrinkled mouth like an old woman adjusting false teeth. Anne-Marie leaned against the ancient splintery wood of the barn wall and listened to the sharp rattling sound of the streams of milk as they hit the sides of the bucket. Uncle Henrik glanced over at her and smiled without pausing in the rhythm of milking. He didn't say anything. Through the barn windows, the pinkish light of sunset fell in irregular shapes upon the stacked hay. Flecks of dust and straw floated there in the light. Uncle Henrik, Anne-Marie said suddenly, her voice cold. You are lying to me. You and Mama both. His strong hands continued, deftly pressing like a pulse against the cow. The steady streams of milk still came. He looked at her again and his deep blue eyes kind and questioning. You are angry, he said. Yes, Mama has never lied to me before, never. But I know there is no great Aunt Bertie, never once. In all the stories I've heard and all the old pictures I've seen, has there ever been a great Aunt Bertie? Uncle Henrik sighed. Blossom looked back at him as if to say, almost done. And indeed, the string, streams of milk lessened and slowed. He tugged at the cow gently but firmly, pulling down the last of the milk. The bucket was half full, frothy at the top. Finally, he set it aside and washed the cow's udder with a clean, damp cloth. Then he lifted the bucket to a shelf and covered it. He rubbed the cow's neck affectionately. At last, he turned to Anne-Marie and wiped his own hands with the cloth. How brave are you, little Anne-Marie? he asked suddenly. She was startled and dismayed. It was a question she did not want to be asked. When she asked it of herself, she didn't like her own answer. Not very, she confessed, looking at the floor of the barn. Tall Uncle Henrik knelt before her so that his face was level with hers. Behind him, Blossom lowered her head, grasped a mouthful of hay in her mouth, and drew it in with her tongue. The kitten cocked its head, waiting, still hoping for spilled milk. I think that is not true, Uncle Henrik said. I think you are like your mama, and like your papa, and like me. Frightened but determined, and if the time came to be brave, I am quite sure you would be very, very brave. But, he added, it is much easier to be brave if you do not know everything. And so your mama does not know everything. Neither do I. We only know what we need to know. Do you understand what I am saying? He asked, looking into her eyes. Anne-Marie frowned. She wasn't sure. What did bravery mean? She had been very frightened that day, not long ago, though now it seemed far in the past, when the soldier had stopped her on the street and asked questions in his rough voice. And she had not known everything then. She had not known that the Germans were going to take away the Jews. And so, when the soldier asked, looking at Ellen that day, what is your friend's name? She had been able to answer him, even though she was frightened. If she had known everything, it would not have been so easy to be brave. She began to understand just a little. Yes, she said to Uncle Henrik. I think I understand. You guessed correctly, he told her. There is no great Aunt Bertie, and never has been. Your mama lied to you, and so did I. We did so, he ex explained, to help you to be brave, because we love you. Will you forgive us for that? Anne Marie nodded. She felt older, suddenly. And I am not going to tell you any more, not now, for the same reason. Do you understand? Anne Marie nodded again. Suddenly there was a noise outside. Uncle Henrik's shoulders stiffened. He rose quickly, went to the window of the barn, stood in the shadows, and looked out. Then he turned back to Anne Marie. It is the hearse, he said. It is Great Aunt Bertie who never was. He smiled wryly. So, my little friend, it is time for the night of mourning to begin. Are you ready? Anne-Marie took her uncle's hand and let, he led her from the barn. The gleaming wooden casket rested on supports in the center of the living room and was surrounded by the fragile, papery flowers that Anne-Marie and Ellen had picked that afternoon. Lighted candles stood in the holders on the table and it cast a soft, flickering light. The hearse had gone, and the solemn-faced men who had carried the casket indoors had gone with it, after speaking quietly to Uncle Henrik. 
Kirsty had gone to bed reluctantly, complaining that she wanted to stay up with the others, but she was grown up enough that she had never before seen a dead person in a closed up box and that it wasn't fair. But Mama had been firm and finally Kirsty, sulking, had trudged upstairs with her dolls under one arm and the kitten under the other. Ellen was silent and had a sad expression. I'm so sorry your Aunt Bertie died, Emery heard her say to Mama, who was smiled sadly and thanked her. Anne Marie had listened and said nothing. So now too, I am lying, she thought. And to my very best friend, I could tell Ellen that that isn't true, that there is no great Anne Bertie. I could take her aside and whisper the secret to her so that she wouldn't have to feel sad. But she didn't. She understood that she was protecting Ellen the way her mother had protected her. Although she didn't understand what was happening or why the casket was there or who, in truth, was in it, she knew that it was safer, better for Ellen to believe in great Aunt Bertie. So she said nothing. Other people came in as the night sky grew darker. A man and a woman, both of them dressed in dark clothing, the woman carrying a sleeping baby, appeared at the door. Uncle Henrik gestured them inside. He nodded to Mama and the girls. They went, following Uncle Henrik, to the living room and sat down quietly. Friends of Great Aunt Bertie, Mama said quietly in response to Anne Marie's questioning look. Anne Marie knew that Mama was lying again, and she could see that Mama understood that she knew. They looked at each other for a long time and said nothing. In that moment, with that look, they became equals. From the living room came the sound of a sleepy baby's brief wail. Anne Marie glanced through the door and saw that the woman open her blouse and begin to nurse the infant, who quieted. Another man arrived, an old man, bearded. Quietly, he went to the living room and sat down, saying nothing to the others, who only glanced at him. The young woman lifted her baby's blanket, covering its face and her own breast. The old man bent his head forward and closed his eyes as if he were praying. His mouth moved silently, forming words that no one could hear. Anne Marie stood in the doorway, watching the mourners as they sat in the candlelit room. Then she turned back to the kitchen and began to help Ellen and Mama as they prepared food. In Copenhagen, she remembered, when Lise died, friends had come to the apartment every evening. All of them had brought food so Mama wouldn't need to cook. Why hadn't these people brought food? Why didn't they talk? In Copen, even though the talk was sad, people had so spoken softly to one another and Mama and Papa. They had talked about Lise, remembering happier times. Thinking about it, as she sliced cheese in the kitchen, Amory realized that these people had nothing to talk about. They couldn't speak of happier times with Great Aunt Bertie when there had never been a Great Aunt Bertie at all. Uncle Henrik came into the kitchen. He glanced at his watch and then at Mama. It's getting late, he said. I should go to the boat. He looked worried. He blew out the candles so that there would be no light at all and opened the door. He stared beyond the gnarled apple tree into the darkness. Good. Here they come, he said in a low, relieved voice. Ellen, come with me. Ellen looked questioningly toward Mama, who nodded. Go with Henrik, she said. Anne Marie watched, still holding the wedge of firm cheese in her hand, as Ellen followed Uncle Henrik into the yard. She could hear a sharp, low cry from Ellen and then sounds of voices speaking softly. For a moment, Uncle Henrik returned. Behind him was Peter Nielsen. Tonight, Peter went first to Mama and hugged her. Then he hugged Anne Marie and kissed her on the cheek, but he said nothing. There was no playfulness to his affection tonight, just a sense of urgency, of worry. He went immediately to the living room, looked around and nodded at the silent people there. Ellen was still outside, but in a moment, the door opened and she returned, held tightly like a little girl, her bare legs dangling against her father's chest. Her mother was beside them.